Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. Okay, today in the Dungeon Dive, we have a nestled deep dive. We are taking a look at four against the great old ones. And four against the great old ones is created by Marco Arnado and also Andreas Sefiligoy. So we have taken before a look at Four Against Darkness, and it's kind of an ongoing uh, deep dive with Four Against Darkness because, uh, boy howdy, is there a lot of stuff available for this game, and more and more is coming out constantly. We will be taking a look soon at some new stuff for Four Against Darkness, mainly the ones that everybody has been waiting for are finally here, and that is, of course, Treacheries of the troublesome towns and this is uh by far the biggest expansion yet for this game it's two volumes nearly 400 pages all focused on adventuring in towns and generating towns uh yeah if you like stuff like fawford and gray mouser uh set in towns like lankmar these kind of thieves world towns and this expansion seems really cool. I also picked up a couple other new ones we'll take a look at soon. Uh, Samora, Island of the Sec Island of Secrets, kind of a lost world there. And then also Tales from the Adventurer's Guild. As part of the ongoing series of this deep dive, we've also taken a look at Alone Against Fear. So Alone Against Fear is a horror version of the game in which you are playing one character and it's kind of a survival horror game, uh, very similar to something like Resident Evil or, um, or Silent Hill. And I do have some videos on that as well. And in this series, we also have this other mode here, or this other game set in this kind of same rule set, and that is Four Against the Great Old Ones. As the name suggests, in this game, you are playing four investigators, kind of like a party of four in Four Against Darkness. And you are going up against Cthulhu and uh, the King in Yellow and Narthotep. And I think uh, Dagon, is Dagon here? Uh, Dagon, uh, Shubnigaroth, Yog sothoth So all kinds of great old ones. You will be fighting against them as you are exploring a map and investigating and trying to find clues. As part of this video, we will also be taking a look at the two expansions for Four Against the Great Old Ones. And those expansions are Carcosa Rising and The Dawning Horror. And these are also by Marco Arnaldo and Andrea Safiligoy. So you might know Marco Arnaldo from his YouTube channel, um, Marco Omni Gamer. And he used to be known as Marco Wargamer. His channel was one of the first board game channels I got into. And his channel, along with Deborah uh, on Geek Gamers, inspired me really to make the Dungeon Dive. We have a lot of overlap in what we like. And I know that Marco is a pretty big fan of the Cthulhu Mythos. And I think he does a really good job of translating it into this kind of pen and paper solo kind of RPG style adventure game. So if you've played games, uh, video games like Inkle's games, like 80 Days, or maybe their version of Sorcery, or other old games like Where in the World is Carmen Santiago, I think you'll have a good idea of the kind of game that For Against the Great Old Ones is because you will be taking your party of four investigators. You are going to be exploring a map of the United States, looking for clues, trying to find one of the great old ones, the great old one that is that you are going to face off against a, a, as a boss in each adventure. And you will travel from one location to the next, keeping track of time because you need to find enough clues and you need to find three clues in order to figure out who your boss is going to be, which great old one you are up against, and then defeat that final boss all within 40 days. And the days are kind of like a currency and you'll be able to spend those days to take certain actions in different locations. Carcosa Rising 
is a supplement that adds a whole bunch of different modular expansions that you can use to expand your games of four against the great old ones. And the Dawning Horror is kind of a little bit of a different expansion. In this expansion, you play as one investigator who will be joined um, by a couple of henchmen, a couple of helpers. And then you will take that single adventure through a paragraph adventure, through a pre-programmed adventure like a choose your own adventure. And this contains five of those pre-programmed adventures. But let's start by taking a look at four against the great old ones. Now I said uh, before, uh, earlier that Marco is a pretty big fan of the uh, Cthulhu mythos. And I think that really does show in, uh, in this game. But if you are just coming to the world of the Cthulhu mythos through, uh, through board games and through other types of uh, tabletop games, you might want to take a step back and maybe read some fiction. And so throughout this video, I'm also going to suggest some really good books to read to kind of augment your fun to, to, help, uh, to help your connection with the world. And one name that we're going to be seeing a lot in this video is, uh, is uh, Robert M. Price. And Robert M. Price is a great anthologist, anthologizer of, of, of Lovecraft's mythos and the Cthulhu mythos. And this book here, Tales of the Love, Lovecraft Mythos, is really, really good. It has a great kind of overview. It, it, it's kind of a, a 101 class. This is kind of your, your, your starter book. I think this will give you a really good sense of what the mythos is, who the major players are, what the major themes are. We've got stories in here by uh, Robert Block, which is fantastic. The Fane of the Black Pharaoh, great story. We have a story by Henry Cutner, Bells of Horror. We have Robert E. Howard's The Fire of, of um, Ashurbanipal. Ashurbanipal? <laughs> I can never say that word. Ashurbanipal. Ash Ashurbanipal. There we go. Uh, Robert A. W. Lowndes, The Abyss, and all kinds of other stories in here. Who else do we have here? So in here, we have other stories by uh, Robert E. Howard, Clark Ashton Smith, Henry Cutner, Arg August Derleth and E. Hoffman Price, among others. So yeah, this book here is really cool. I really do like it. This book actually has one of my favorite weird fiction stories of all time. And that is, where did that go here? The Guardian of the Book by Henry Hasse, or Hasse. I'm not sh quite sure how to pronounce his last name there. But that story is so cool. I love it. If you like stories about uh, dangerous, esoteric works of fiction or esoteric books that uh, books that exist within books like the Necronomicon, then that story uh, is quite good. And I think you'll get a lot out of it if you haven't read it. But let's take a look now at Four Against the Great Old Ones. We'll just kind of do a flip through. Now, I do not actually recommend buying the, uh, the physical copies of this game. This game plays much easier if you get the PDFs because this game does have a lot of bookkeeping. You will need to keep track of certain uh, things that happen in each location. You'll need to keep track of a map. You'll need to keep track of your characters. And there are a lot of places in the book where it expects you to check off on certain little boxes. And it's just a whole heck of a lot easier if you buy the PDFs so you can just print out the pages you need from one game to the next. If I could do my collection over again, I would uh, go the PDF route for this game. I think it just makes a lot more sense. Here we get a little introduction into the mythos, into the writings of H.P. Lovecraft and what he was all about and then a basic concept of the game. So like I said, you will be playing as four investigators. And in this game I have going right now, I have four investigators. I have Mr. Montgomery, an occultist. I have Billy Boy, a gangster. I have Smith, a private eye. And uh, Nurse, I have uh, Betty, Nurse Betty there. And these are my investigators. Your investigators will be uh, armed with certain weapons and certain powers and certain skills. Uh, they can track down arcane items. Some investigators can use spells and magical abilities. And then your four investigators can also hire henchmen and they can hire helpers. 
Right now, I have three normal henchmen, and henchmen can help you fight against minions and against vermin, against the low-level enemies. Uh, helpers can never help you fight against a boss, but helpers will help you uh, soak up some damage and deal some damage, but they are also very easy to kill. And so your helpers will kind of come and go. And as you explore, you'll have an opportunity to hire more helpers. You will also have an opportunity to recruit new investigators because your investigators will die. This is a very dangerous world, of course. If you played board games like Arkham Horror or Eldritch Horror, uh, you know you know the drill. This really does give me that feel of, of uh, Eldritch Horror in a kind of a book form. And that kind of globe trouting adventure that you get in Eldritch Horror or even a Flying Frogs game like Fortune and Glory. I do also feel that in this game. And then you'll also keep track of your clues. And we'll talk about clues a little bit in, in more detail in just a bit. But you'll be taking those four investigators, uh, moving around a map of the United States and trying to find your clues. And the different classes you can play are an occultist a medium, a nurse, a professor, a spy, a veteran, a gangster, or a private detective. And then each one of the expansions also adds two additional in investigators. The mechanisms are pretty simple in this game. Everything is a D6 roll. And usually you will be rolling one D6, adding or subtracting small bonuses, usually adding your level, or if you have a penalty, maybe subtracting one, and then trying to get a target number. A lot of the target numbers are four, some are five or six, and then the game also uses an exploding uh, die mechanism to where if you ever roll a six, you can keep rolling, and then you can keep adding those numbers to hit larger and larger target numbers. When you are up against an enemy, an enemy might come at level four. That's the target number that you need to kill that enemy. If you get, uh, if your attack value is in multiples of four greater than one, then you can do additional damage. So if you're able to get a roll up to eight or 12, then you can do three points of damage instead of just one point of damage for one success. So it's a very simple system and you will be rolling a lot of D6. You will be keeping track of a lot. There is a lot of bookkeeping in this game. You'll be keeping track of your character's life, their hit points, their sanity, their equipment, uh, their special abilities, and any scrolls and or special powers and spells that they find along the way. Each of the locations that you go to will have a list of activities that you can do. Those activities will include things like resting, or recruiting or hiring helpers. And then a lot, most of the locations also have a investigation chart that you will roll on and you will usually roll a D6. Sometimes you will add bonuses depending on who's in your party or depending on other things that you have located throughout your adventure. And then you will look up that chart to see what you have found in that location. And then your main goal is to travel around and try to find clues. Every time you get a clue, it helps to pinpoint who the boss is going to be, who the great old one is going to be that you are going to face off against at the end of that adventure. Hopefully, hopefully finding them and, and defeating it within 40 days. Each of the things that you can do in each location will cost you a certain number of days. But when you find a clue, the first thing you do is you roll a D6 for that clue and you jot down that number. So a six. And then you do the same thing for clue two and then the same thing for clue three. And then you look up, you total those at the end and you find out who the final encounter is going to be against. This does help you pinpoint throughout the game which final encounter you might have. I think I kind of did a bad job of explaining it, but if you want to uh, pause here and just read, you might be able to, uh, to gather some more information there. But I think that's pretty cool. And each one of the final encounters is kind of like its own little mini game that you will play. And it's not just a big confrontation. There are mazes you have to go through and, and different types of uh, challenges that your investigators will be up against to defeat that final confrontation. So this game does a pretty good job of the player's knowledge of the game kind of mirroring your investigators knowledge of the things they are investigating. And what I mean by that is when you start your first game, 
you are going to be very lost because you start the game with a roll of a D6 and that determines where your starting location is according to a chart in this book. And then once you start, you are just kind of left to your own devices to figure things out. And as you go to certain locations, such as this location of Arkham, you have a list of activities that you can do. So you can rest, you can equip, uh, you can get different weapons to equip. You can spend days to recruit new investigators into your party if you want to replace an investigator or one of your investigators dies and you want to fill an empty slot. So depending on, you can uh, here in Arkham, you can recruit an occultist, a medium, a professor, and a spy. And each one of those will take two days to recruit. So you will mark off two days on your day tracker there. And so uh, marking off days is really important. And you think 40 days is a lot to get your stuff done. But as you start playing more and more, you realize that time takes away very, very quickly. And you can never do everything that you want to do. And that's part of the tension. That's part of the drama in this game is spending your days wisely and efficiently. So you can also spend a day to hire a helper, uh, maybe uh, this uh, a henchman, or you can also hire captains and airline pilots because some of these locations will have ports and will have airports. And then if you have an airline pilot, then you can go from one uh, airport to the next by only spending like uh, by spending less time, because as you move around the map, you will have to spend time traveling and the number on the line connecting to locations that tells you how many days it takes to travel from that location to the next. For instance, to go from San Francisco to New York takes five days, but to go from New York to Providence only takes one. However, if you wanted to go from New York to Boston, you could bypass Providence, but that would take two days. So again, traveling, using your days wisely on how you travel is also important. Trying to find those airline pilots and those sea captains to hire so you can get around the uh, map uh, faster. Because what you might find is towards the end of the game, you might be down here in New Orleans, but you might find that maybe the, the, the end, um, the, the final confrontation is in Innsmouth. That's a lot of days to get from New Orleans to Ansmith. But if you have a sea captain and you can hire, um, you can charter a ferry, you can get up to Ansmith very, very quickly from New Orleans. Now, right now I am in St. Louis. But as a further example here, we have Arkham. So once you have done all of your actions up here, then you can spend a point of day, uh, you can spend a, a day investigating. And when you investigate, you roll a D6 and you look up that entry. Some entries can only be used once. Those will have a single box. Some entries will have multiple boxes, kind of sub tables within that nestle, nestled within that table. So those can be triggered more than one time. Those can be investigated more than one time, but a lot of them are only one time. And then you read that passage and you do what it says and you start connecting the dots. You start filling in the gaps between your story, how one location can lead to the next. Sometimes you might find a particular NPC in Arkham, and then maybe that uh, NPC will help you in Innsmouth or things like that. But there are all kinds of different locations. So let's see, we have Arkham here. We have the Backwoods. We have uh, Big Cypress Swamp, Boston, the Catskills Mountains, Chicago, uh, Dunwich there. We have Innsmouth. We have Kingsport, Los Angeles, New Orleans. Uh, New York, Providence, Salem, San Francisco, St. Louis, uh, Townsend. And then here we have our final encounter. So we have a final encounter with Cthulhu, with Dagon, with Chata, uh, Gatanothua. I can never pronounce that guy's name. Gatanothua. Gatanothua. Uh, you discover that a deranged cult is attempting to free the gigantic Gatanothua which was brought to Earth by, Yog by Yogoth Spawn in ancient times. Is he the frog god? I can't remember what he is. Uh, there's Narthotep, one of my favorites. The Ceremonial Cavern, Shubnigaroth. So Shubnigaroth, you have to go through this forest and it's like this giant labyrinth that you have to work your way through. And you can get lost and have to uh, spend time trying to find your way back to the, the right path there. 
Then we have Yogg Sothoth, and each one of those has its own little game. And then at the end of the book, we also have a gate table. We have a Dreamlands table. There are arcane items that you can find. As you find more arcane items, some of those will have mechanical things that you can use them uh, during your game to help you. Some of them do not. At any time, you can trade in a certain number of arcane items for a clue. I think the rate is you can trade in three different arcane items for a single clue, or you can trade in two of the same arcane item for a different clue. So that's another way that you can get clues besides just finding them in your investigation. But Four Against the Great Old Ones, as I said, is a game where the player's information of how the game plays does mirror that of the investigators as they are learning more. Because the more you play the game, I think the better you'll get. You'll learn where clues are. You will learn things about the different great old ones that you are uh, facing off against in that final confrontation. And you will get better at the game. It doesn't have an infinite amount of replayability. But I think it has enough, especially for the price. What is it? I think it's like 10 bucks or something. And you can get quite a bit of game out of this for $10. I think it's pretty cool. It's a lot of fun. It does feel like a game of Eldritch Horror just in a book form. And I do have a lot of fun connecting the dots between the various investigations, between the various random things that happen to create an engaging, entertaining and compelling story. So right now I am in St. Louis. Let's take a look at St. Louis here for an example. And the locations are in alphabetical order, so it's pretty easy to find everything that you need. So here I am in St. Louis, and the things I can do here is I can rest, I can equip, I can recruit. I don't need to equip everything. All of my investigators have pretty good weapons now. There are different types of weapons, and those will be regular, mighty, special, and experimental. And so mighty weapons always add a plus one to your attack roll. Regular weapons add a plus zero, but you need to have some kind of weapon to attack or you are at a minus one. And then special weapons will have their own special unique abilities as same as experimental weapons. And each of the characters will be proficient in a certain number of those uh, of those weapons. So for instance, the occultist, Mr. Montgomery, he is only proficient in regular weapons. But Smith, my private eye, is proficient in regular, mighty, special, and experimental. So depending on what kind of weapons you find, you want to give them to an investigator who is uh, who prefers that type of weapon. So you can get different types of weapons here. We could get a knife, a hockey stick, a shotgun. We can recruit a professor, a spy, a nurse, a medium, or a private detective. We could hire up to two help helpers, a Jesuit scholar. Uh, that could help us with our lore test. That's kind of cool. We can also investigate the American Archaeology Society, Archaeological Society, one day per encounter. You can add plus one to your roles to determine encounters if a professor is a member of your party. Okay, so as you can see, certain uh, certain classes, certain professions will give you certain bonuses depending on where you are in the world. So I do not have a professor, so I'm going to spend one day so I'm going to mark off the next day, which is at 19. I'm almost halfway done through this adventure. As soon as I hit day 20, it's all downhill from there. But let's see what I find when I'm investigating the American Archaeological Society. Um, a two. OK, so here we have a two. So I would mark that off because there's only one box there. So that means that I can only ever encounter this two one time. If I spend another day investigating, the archaeological society and I roll a two again, then I can just re-roll. So here we are. I am in St. Louis on my chart here, and I am just going to mark off two to show that that uh, area is complete. So let's see what happens here. Uh, you, uh, your search of the documents of the society has attracted unwanted attention. A masked figure darts out from behind a column stabs a character and vanishes before anyone can react. Remove a helper, your choice, or one life from a random investigator. You can roll again tomorrow at a plus one. Okay, so somebody comes out and assassinates one of my helpers or damages one of my, one of my investigators. I'm going to have that assassin comes out and kills henchman number one here. All right, so I'm going to erase henchman number one. 
Four henchman number one. Never got a name, but he was assassinated. I will remember him uh, fondly. Yeah, right. Okay, but so we can uh, add a plus one tomorrow. Tomorrow is a game term. That means that you have to do kind of the same action directly the next day in this location. So I'm going to investigate. I'm going to mark off uh, day 20 now. Now I can roll on this chart again, adding one. Six. Okay, so that would be a seven because there is no, or a seven, but that would be a six because there is no seven. So here we go. Six has one box, so that means I can encounter that once. So I will put a check mark on six here on my location checklist. You can get a pack of printouts if you go to either, I think it's BGG or the Four Against Darkness Facebook group also has all of your uh, printouts that you will need to print to play the game. But let's read number six here. Among the documents of an annual meeting of the society, you find several letters by Inspector John R. Lagrasse of the New Orleans Police. Apparently, Lagrasse has considerable experience in supernatural cases and has worked together with the society in the past. When in New Orleans, you can choose entry six of the investigate the town table as your activity for the day without rolling. This will allow you to talk to Lagrasse. Okay, so... I probably want to head straight to New Orleans now so I can do that. So let's go ahead and do that. So I can fly from St. Louis to New Orleans there, and that will take three days. So I'm now at uh, day 23 here. Okay, so day 23. Let's find New Orleans here. Let's see what we can do here first. So we can rest, equip, recruit. Um, Maybe do I want to I, do I want to get another helper to replace my henchman? No, I don't think so. So one thing that I forgot is when you do choose to investigate and you roll on the table, you have to choose who is going on that investigation uh, as far as your helpers go. If you forget to choose, then all of your helpers are with you. I usually take all of my helpers with me, but sometimes they do die very quickly. So sometimes it is beneficial to not take all of your helpers with you, but we're just going to take them with us. And just for the sake of this video, we will go straight to the investigate phase. I will check off one more day here. So we're at day 24 and let's see here. Uh, you visit the police station where you talk to, where you talk with Inspector Lagrasse. He is familiar with supernatural investigations and is willing to help you with the mission. He indicates the place where he believes strange cults gather in the swamps. If investigating the swamps outside of New Orleans, add plus one to all roles to determine encounters. You can also immediately recruit one to three policemen as helpers. Oh, nice. So I could take two policemen with me. Then I could go to the big Cypress swamp and I could continue my investigations looking for the final two clues that I need to, de to determine who I'm going to face off against as one of the great old ones. So one of the great old ones that you will face off against in Four Against the Great Old Ones is Nalarthotep. And the Nalarthotep cycle is another really, really good collection. So all of these Chaosium collections are fantastic, especially if you're just getting into Mythos Fiction and you want to get a really good sampling of all kinds of different authors and all kinds of different stories. These are probably your the best bang for your buck. I think most of these are edited by Robert M. Price, and Price also will usually have some kind of introduction. And in his introductions, he gives a really good overview of the Great Old One, of the theme of the collection, puts it into historical context, and writes a little bit about each one of the authors. It's really good, uh, very valuable information. But this collection here has stories by Lord Dunsany, by Lovecraft, uh, August Derleth, Robert Block, Lynn Carter, um, Richard Tierney. So all kinds of really cool um, authors here. The Mighty Messenger of the Outer Gods, Narthotep, has also been known to deliver tidings from, from the Great Old Ones. He is the only Outer God who chooses to personify his presence on our planet. That really does make him unique, and it makes him such an interesting character in this overall, in the overall mythos. A god of a thousand forms, he comes to Earth to mock, to wreak havoc, and to spur on humanity's self-destructive urges. 
But yeah, this is also another really great collection. Okay, speaking of great collections, now we're going to take a look at Carcosa Rising, which is a collection of modular little expansion bits that you can plug into your game. And Carcosa Rising is, of course, based off of uh, Robert W. Chambers and Ambrose Bierce, their writings of Hastur and the Yellow Sign and the King in Yellow. So the Yellow Sign, this collection here from uh, Chaosium, and this one actually is edited and has an introdu uh, introduction by S.T. Joshi. And this collection right here is fantastic. Uh, Robert W. Chambers is actually my favorite of the Mythos writers. And he was one of the main writers who inspired Lovecraft. And this collection here by Robert M. Price, The Hastur Cycle, also contains some of the stories by Robert W. Chambers. And Price, in his introduction here, he talks a great deal about Chambers and about, uh, and about Bierce. And he relays the information that uh, there was a, a, a writer and anthologist and editor named uh, August Derleth. And August Derleth, of course, is the gentleman who started Arkham House uh, Fiction, Arkham House uh, Books, the publication. And when he was first putting together the Cthulhu Mythos, he thought that it might need, he thought that it should be called the, myth, the mythology of Hastur, the Hastur Mythos, because Hastur was this uh, entity that kind of connected the old school with the newer school at the time of Lovecraft. But of course, it ended up becoming the Cthulhu Mythos. But um, I love the yellow sign and the king in yellow. One of Robert W. Chambers' stories, The Repairer of Reputations, is actually my favorite short story of all time. I think it is just fantastic. It is so creepy, uh, filled with so much paranoia. But if you're looking to learn more about the king in yellow, you should read the yellow sign or maybe track down this uh, Hastur cycle from Chaosium. Very, very good. But at the beginning of Carcosa Rising, Marco does give a nice little introduction about Hastur, about the King in Yellow, and about how Lovecraft was building upon the mythology already created by Chambers and by Beers. But this says here that the disturbances caused by the upcoming Great Ritual have begun to tear at the fabric of reality, and well-known places have already been replaced by a distorted version of them from other dimensions. Meanwhile, the King in Yellow and his agent, the Pallid Mask, manipulate events from behind the scenes and poison the thoughts of unsuspecting people. And who is the mysterious plump man who seems to be following your party? So if you haven't um, received this game yet, if you haven't uh, taken the plunge on this game yet and you're interested in doing so, I recommend just picking up both of these books together because Carcosa Rising greatly augments four against the great old ones. I think this is a fantastic expansion and it's really my favorite kind of expansion because it just contains a whole bunch of things that you can choose in a modular fashion to plug into your base game of Four Against Darkness. So what does it contain? Well, let's take a look here. The first thing you're going to get is two new investigators, two new professions, the Cool Doctor and the Dreamer. And then you will get a whole bunch of other things that you can use. And if you want to, you can roll a D6 and determine randomly which one you are going to get, or you can just pick one. It also has an alternate uh, setup chart, so you can roll to find alternate places where you might start your adventures. So I think that is really cool as well. So after the two new classes, we get into the other places. And these are, I think there's three new uh, detailed locations that you can use to replace the locations from your original book. And so these will add a little more variety to your explorations and to your investigations. So you will have a new uh, chapter for the, the cat skills. So you have the other cat skills, new things you can do and new investigations that you can have in the cat skills. And then we have the other New Orleans, new things you can do here and new investigations. Very cool. A little more detailed. And then we have the other New York. And here we have new things you can do and brand new investigations. I love this. I'm hoping there is another 
uh, expansion in the works that includes other versions of other locations from the base game. I think that will help a lot in improving the overall uh, replayability. One of my favorites here is the Perilous Journeys module. As you travel from one location to the next, if you're using the Perilous Journeys module, when you reach your final destination, you roll a D6. And on a one, you have a Perilous Journey. And then you have to roll up on a sub table in this chapter, depending on uh, your mode of transportation. If you were on land, you will roll up on this table here. If you were flying, you will roll up on this table. If you were traveling by sea, you will roll up on this table. Um, most of the modular expansions in this book will make the game harder. I think this is a game that you should plan on playing to lose. At least your first dozen or so games. Play to lose. I think that's a good uh, philosophy to have when you play these kinds of games especially if you're playing with the things in this book here. They are, it is a fun game to lose because of all the bad things that can happen to your investigators. So Carcosa is of course a mythical place here. And this is another location that you can gain entry into that you can have your own type of adventures in Carcosa and your own investigative uh, table here. And then we have the pilot mask, which is kind of a sub boss, kind of a, a, a major boss, but it doesn't count as one of the great old ones. But if you wanted to face off against a new great old one, you could also choose to face off against the king in yellow. And uh, perhaps my second favorite, or maybe this is my favorite, I'm not sure if it's Perilous Journeys or this one, but there is another module here called the Underground Temple. And this actually adds a little dungeon crawl like Four Against Darkness to your games of Four Against the Great Old Ones. When you are in Chicago, New York, the Big Cypress Swamp, Providence, or San Francisco, there is a chance that you can find this underground temple. And then you'll uh, roll to generate your temple. The temple will be usually from four to six rooms. And then there's a D66 table here to roll to find out what is in each one of those rooms with a final room with an objective room boss at the end. I'll show you an example here of the temple I went through the underground temple in Chicago. And so I entered here and I entered here and I found a small library. I found some scrolls of exorcism. I went to this room and found a man in a cage. I uh, went up here and some kind of ritual was happening. Um, went over here and found this altar. Uh, come to find out that one of my henchmen was secretly a cultist and he betrayed me. So then I had to fight off some cultists. And then finally, I made it to my final room here and I ended up facing off by having to defeat the Priestess Medusa. And so that was a little dungeon crawl that I had underground in Chicago in this underground temple. And that was a lot of fun. I think that little module adds quite a bit of flavor to the games. And then finally, we have this one here called the Echoes from Yugoth. So Yugoth, of course, is this kind of epic poem that, uh, that, that Lovecraft wrote. The Fungi from Yugoth, I think it was called. And this is kind of a little poetry mini game that you can participate in that can help you find different clues and stuff. So yeah, just a fantastic expansion. I really don't see any reason why if you're wanting to get into this game that you wouldn't just buy both of these at the same time because they augment and they, they work together so perfectly. One of the things in this uh, in the original book here in Four Against the Great Old Ones is the Dreamlands. And the Dreamlands is a really fascinating area that Lovecraft worked in earlier in his career. And it's probably my favorite Lovecraft stuff besides uh, At the Mountains of Madness, which, which is actually my favorite work from Lovecraft. But uh, the dreams of terror and death, the dream cycle of Lovecraft is really fantastic. I love all of these stories so much. The Doom That Came to Sarnoth, The Nameless City, The Cats of Ulthar, and of course, The, the Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath. Really um, interesting writing, very, uh, very ornate, very dense. I think this is at Lovecraft at some of his densest, but it's also uh, Lovecraft at some of his most uh, creative and weird. And so, yeah, I really do like the dream cycle. And if you have never read the dream cycle, I do highly recommend it. And this collection here, the dream cycle of Lovecraft, and that is from Ballantyne and Del Rey. And this book here actually contains an introduction by uh, Neil Gaiman. 
So the final um, expansion here we'll take a look at in this nestled deep dive is the Dawning Horror, also by Marco and Andrea. And so this is a uh, collection of five choose your own adventures. But what makes this one a little bit different is that each of the choose your own adventures in this book is designed for one investigator and three henchmen. So at the beginning of a game, you will choose which adventure you want to go on. You will choose one investigator and you will take up to three henchmen with you. And so it's kind of uh, focuses on a single investigator, focuses on kind of a smaller, more personal story. And what's really cool is there is this chart here. And if you successfully make it through an adventurer, you get to level up that profession. And then you can take those leveled up professions into other games of four against the great old ones. That is super cool. It almost adds this kind of a legacy element. This also includes two new um, professions. So we have the archeologist here. And then we also have the redeemed cultist. And then our paragraph adventures are the horror of the mine. And each one of these will have a little map, kind of like this map here, but you're not having to keep track of time as you move. These are smaller adventures. These aren't globe trouting adventures. These adventures usually uh, take place in one single location. And then as you move from one location to the next on this map, you will turn to the corresponding paragraph to find out what your encounter is at that particular uh, room. We also have the Howl of the Mutated here. So here we have our map of the Howl of the Mutated. And then some of these adventures get a little more complex with the different sub tables for wandering bosses or wandering enemies, wandering minions, um, turning this more into a game of Four Against Darkness. There we have our paragraphs. And then our next adventure here is called the Night Tour. With lots of mummies and you're uh, going on this uh, this uh, kind of like a museum there. You're exploring a museum, a night at the museum. And then we also have, after that one, we have Returning to the Antarctica. So here we have kind of a sequel to At the Mountains of Madness. Several years ago, the publication of an extraordinary report called At the Mountains of Madness caused great scandal and commotion and was labeled as the ramblings of a madman. I love At the Mountains of Madness. I think that is such a fantastic novel. So we can return to Antarctica and explore the Mountains of Madness again. Uh, maybe find the Elder Things and figure out what's going on there. And then we have The Inheritance. So the inheritance, as you know, a lot, a lot of these stories start with some poor sap inheriting uh, some town or some some house in some uh, little town out in the middle of nowhere. And then they go to that house and they discover some kind of basement or some kind of secret room that usually stores some kind of uh, arcane tomes and knowledge. And then they find out that their, their uh, ancestors have been uh, taken into another world by the great old ones. And it's up to them to prevent that from happening again. And usually they just end up going mad. But here we have, this is kind of a village crawl here. So we can explore certain things like we can explore the farms, we can explore the mines, we can explore the swamps or the church. Then here we have all of our paragraphs that will detail those explorations. So this expansion is pretty cool. I've only played through one. I've only played through the first adventure and I lost. I died. Um, but uh, I think I would recommend getting this last after Carcosa Rising and the um, original four against the great old ones. So yeah, that was a nestled deep dive. And I think this system is really cool. It's simple. It's all, you know, basically rolling D6s, adding or subtracting bonuses and trying to hit target numbers, uh, having little dungeon crawls like in Four Against Darkness, doing little point crawls kind of like in, um, in Alone Against Fear, um, exploring those cities, exploring those maps. If you like games like Arkham Horror or Eldritch Horror, I think uh, this does a really good job of kind of giving you that feel, giving you that vibe. Uh, but keeping it kind of condensed into a game that you can play on a smaller table, a game that doesn't take nearly as much time. I think you could probably play through a game once you learn the system. 
I think you could easily finish a game in, in under an hour or maybe right at an hour. And I've had a lot of fun with it. I think I like Alone Against Fear a little better. I love that. I love that kind of survival, the, the kind of survival horror that that game presents. I love exploring that town and just all of the weird things that happen in that game are really, really cool. But uh, this one I know gets a little bit of criticism. It doesn't offer up maybe as much replay value as the other games. There are definitely not as many expansions for this as there are for Four Against Darkness, but I don't think any game has as many expansions as Four Against Darkness. But I don't think the replay value of this one is as, is as uh, low as other people say. And I think this game does reward repeat plays because you will get better at it and you will have uh, maybe a better experience the more you know about the game, the more you know about the world that you are investigating. Uh, but yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed this deep dive into the realms of Four Against the Great Old Ones. And we will talk to you later. Take it easy. Bye-bye.